Today we're going to see pointers and memory allocation, which is a very important part of C and C++ programming. Um, and I will kind of pack it with loads of different concepts, but we will come back to some of those concepts later again, because we don't know all the basics yet or, or the basics that I want to present in this course. So we'll far, first start very easily with pointers, um, or easily. Uh, usually pointers are a little bit of a nightmare for most people. Um, because they are uh, quite low level and they're different from just having variables or references as in many other uh, programming languages. So we already know from now, officially, if you completely started from scratch in this course, that if you create a variable and in you initialize that, that somewhere in memory, the C compiler or C++ compiler for you will reserve some memory. It knows how much memory will need to be reserved how to manage that memory, how to read those values and get those back, interpret those, and what type of type is uh, assigned to this, or that is saying what type of type is assigned to this, as well as which operators you can use with this particular variable. And, that is, and the, the important thing is it's somewhere in memory, um, and you typically can keep on thinking of memory as this gray <coughs> box that you kind of fill. We'll see at the end of the course that it's not really like that. It's split in four parts. Uh, but I think for most purposes, you don't really need to know all the specifics. So we're not going to go too deep in that. So as soon as you reserve a variable and initialize it or give it a value, you will have a memory location assigned. Now, internally, this memory is a, a type of long, long list of a certain units. You could take this unit as a byte. Typically, most computer architectures are not working with bytes, but it makes it easier for me to show so that's why I took always in the previous slides as well, these bytes, these white blocks are, you know, one byte block is a byte, consisting out of four bits, as you can see here. And it means that uh, my integer, which is an integer, therefore holds four bytes, um, is for instance at memory address zero. Of course, it's not going to be zero in real life, but again, it's a very simplistic uh, example. Then if you have a character, this is only one byte, so if I reserve this over here, it will start at the next available memory position. So it's uh, address number four, right? Because this is one, this is two, and this is three. Byte three, and this is the fourth byte. And like that, you know, every bit that uh, is getting reserved in your memory also has an address. That's something I think that is also not too hard to conceptualize. And I think that is something that everybody does all the time in programming anyway. Somewhere in memory, things get reserved for you and get, uh, get allocated for you. Now a pointer is a different type. So it's basically not a, a modification of a type. It's basically something completely different on its own that allows you to not store a particular value, like an integer could st uh, store a whole number, or a double could store a floating point, or a bool could uh, store a true-false uh, value. No, a pointer is actually storing a memory location and therefore points at somewhere else in memory. It kind of is an accessor. It basically allows you to access part of memory and then uh, change that or read that part of memory from another part of memory. So that's, in essence, what a pointer is. So when you create a pointer, you need to know what it's pointing to because only that way C++ knows what it's pointing at, how big this uh, piece of memory is that you're pointing at. It starts at a certain address, but it needs to know, for instance, where it needs to end. And if you're then following the point, it needs to know what type this is, what operators can be used on this content, how you interpret this content, etc. So that is what is happening through a pointer. <laughs> Somebody left and then uh, is getting called. That's ironic. No, it's not ironic, but anyway. Um, so this is what uh, a pointer typically does. Now you can initialize a pointer, or you don't have to initialize a pointer. So in this line, everything that is happening is that you're saying you create a pointer somewhere in memory. So that is what is happening over here. And you don't let it point to anything yet. But it, you know already that this is a pointer to an integer. Then you can assign it a value, and the value over here is the address of an other integer somewhere in memory. So my integer, for instance, is an integer. So its address we can take using this operator over here, this ampersand. That means from now on the pointer holds the address 70 over here. So this is the binary 
uh, 470. So, and since my integer was at memory location 70, you will see then that my, uh, that my int pointer now points to the content of my integer, right? So that is what is happening here. And then you can change this value just as you could change any other type of, uh, of variable um, by using the star in front of it. That is called the referencing the pointer. So you use the pointer to uh, get a name of a certain piece of uh, memory and then you treat that memory as if it was an integer. In this case, it has already a name. It has my integer. But as we will see, it does not even have to uh, have a name. So through a pointer, you can dynamically reserve uh, or point to some memory, reserve it as well, and then interpret it just like a variable. And because this can be done with any type, you know, it can be done with a character, with a Boolean, or with classes, as we will see as well. So if you have an object of a particular class, also that is treated as a particular type. Also, you can have a pointer to that. So the memory space does not have to be two or four bytes. It can also be a megabyte or a gigabyte even, if that object is that large. Now the second part that is then uh, coming along with it is if I want to reserve a piece of memory that I didn't give a name yet as a variable. So that is what is happening here. Now typically when you start with uh, creating a pointer and you don't immediately initialize it, or afterwards, when it's not referring to a valid memory space anymore, you assign it to the value null. So N-U-L-L -L in capitals is a specific um, word in C++ that says now this pointer is not referring to any valid memory location. So that if you're doing something with this pointer, like you're giving it a new value, for instance, uh, through uh, dereferencing it, you will get an, a compiler error and not some very... Um, strange behavior from the executable as it's being run on your computer. So typically people, whenever, uh, or programmers, whenever they uh, don't immediately initialize a pointer, or the pointer is kind of dangling, is loose, does not point to a specific memory location, then they always uh, assign it to the value no. And then creating a new piece of memory goes like this. So you have your, um, your uh, pointer. You can do this in one line as well, of course. So uh, just saying int star my pointer equals new int. But here we did it in two goes. So if you go to this, um, you will create a new integer somewhere in memory. So that's, I think, easy to read. So the new keyword is basically succeeded by a type. And that is enough for the C++ compiler to operate on. So it knows now that now it needs to reserve somewhere in memory enough space for an integer, um, and it creates this space in memory. So that is what this part at the right does. As soon as that is uh, done, what is returned by C++, because this is a statement like any others, and it returns then something, it returns then in this case the pointer to what was just created. So if this new integer over here has been created at address 70 here, um, then my int pointer now is again, getting the value 70, right? So it's pointing to this particular memory location. And at that point, there is no variable, no integer with a specific name. It is, there's a pointer that points to this specific uh, integer with no name, right? So it, it's a little bit of a different concept that we had before through our normal regular variables. So you don't have a, a, a variable that's immediately reserved and named. You have a pointer that is pointed to the variable. And it can only be addressed or changed by dereferencing it, which is what is happening over here. So star my int pointer is then following the pointer to the contents of that integer and then um, assigning it the value 17. So now you'll see that uh, this in binary is 17 and then um, you can assign it a value, you can read its value as before. Now, if you have a new piece of, in, uh, of memory that you reserve, then we know that this over here is something that we now have addressed through my int pointer. In this function, which happens to be the main function, but it could also be some other function, we know as soon as we leave this function, all the local variables are gone. They're not addressable anymore, or the, the contents is, uh, are as gone as well. It means my pointer that I reserved over here, my int pointer, will be gone as well after this function ends. Because of that, um, what typically is then explicitly or explicitly needed 
uh, is for every new that you do, you have to make sure that somewhere you also delete this piece of memory. So you allocated here some memory for an integer. If you wouldn't have done this, uh, this next line over here, my int pointer would not be usable anymore because that is a variable, that, uh, a pointer that is gone after leaving that function. But the piece of memory would still be there if this was a normal function, if this was not the main function. So the delete uh, keyword allows us to, by hand, remove something uh, from memory. So to deallocate that memory that was taken by my int pointer and just getting rid of that. So after this line over here, my in pointer is a pointer that is not really pointing to a specific memory location. Um, it is, it's pointing to uh, something that is not, uh, not usable anymore. And typically when you do this, uh, as a programmer, it's always a sa uh, quite safe to, then to also assign it to the value null afterwards to kind of prevent that anyone afterwards would do something with this pointer. This pointer is still there, but the memory that it points to is not there anymore if you execute this delete or if you use this delete keyword. Okay, That's, those are the basics of a pointer. And I think as soon as you go through the slides and then play this uh, by yourself, I think it does make sense. Yes, a question. So the pointer itself is something exactly like this. So the, the question was, if you delete it and it was not pointing to a memory location before, where does it point to afterwards? Well, that, that, that is not really, uh, or it's a good question, I think. But um, the real question is what happens when you uh, execute the, or when you um, have the statement delete followed by a pointer. Nothing happens to the pointer. The pointer is still having, or in many cases, depending on what compiler you have, could point to exactly that memory location. What delete actually provokes or, or uh, does in this case is make sure that in terms of memory management, C++ is not reserving that memory that we had before. So if you go back, so here we had an integer. Once you do delete, it's gone now, right? So it's a memory location that is pointing to that is being changed. The pointer, not necessarily. The pointer, if the, uh, if the compiler was, uh, is a nifty one, then it could automatically point to null, for instance, for us. That would be nice. But there is no guarantee that any, that any C++ compiler will do this. So then typically, it would be good to uh, point this to null as well afterwards. Right? So it, it could have exactly the same value. In fact, here in our example, it still has the value 70. But the problem is then, C++ knows that this uh, memory location 70 is not a valid one. As soon as we want to follow this, strange behavior could arise now. And that's why we need to manage things ourselves, typically, when we do this management of memory. A follow-up question? Mm-hmm. Why do we need to create an integer here? Or yeah. well, so when declaring a pointer, you need to know what it's pointing to, and therefore you need a type. A bit louder, please. I can't hear. Oh, here, yeah. right? Because this part on the right side, this is producing something, right? This is producing a pointer to an integer over here, and this is then assigned to my int pointer. Right? So this over here is producing this 70. Think of it as that, address 70. And this is then what is uh, the value, the new value of our pointer. And before that, our pointer, so we've seen it as well, there's no guarantee that if you don't initialize any variable, it's the same for a pointer, it might be zero. Like if you turn back time and go to the first line over here, it might be zero, but it might also be some random number that was there before in memory. Right? So in the early days, C and C++ wanted to optimize things, so they don't always deliver default values when you, initialize, uh, when you don't initialize a variable that you then create or declare. Yeah. Okay? 
Any other questions? Yes? Wouldn't be okay to make the new int in the first line? Yes. Exactly. Absolutely. That would have been the better option here in this program because we're doing this in the next uh, line anyway. So it would have been much better to say we want to create a new integer and we assign this to uh, the integer pointer, my int pointer. No, it is allowed. You can do this. Yes, yes, yes. You should do this, in fact, because then you avoid having to, having to point first at null and then assigning it to our uh, new integer that we create and allocate. You could, could replace the null with the new integer. Yep. Word, yes. Could, let's just start with uh, the point of the my index is not work, no problem. Exactly. That is a very good question. So, uh, okay, uh, this is another thing. So where does the star belong to? Does it belong to the name or does it belong to the type? Because that's actually what you're asking about, right? It's actually the type, really. And it's, uh, again, it's... it's um, uh, uh, syntax, I was going to say, but it's not syntax. It's kind of a style thing to where you put the star. I could have put the star straight after the int as well, then put a space, and then put my int pointer. Then you would not have been uh, confused here now, right? So you're absolutely right there, uh, because this star right in front over here, this is the referencing the pointer. This over here is creating a new pointer with this name, and it has the type integer pointer. That's more or less how you should see it. Yeah. So whenever you declare a variable, it might uh, uh, cause less confusion if you do it this way, but certain style guides do it this way. Again, it's a matter of taste sometimes, I think. Yeah. But it is not possible to, to uh, make a star in front of the second line, because that would make a wrong statement? Or yes. Because putting the star in front of the, so like over here in the third line, right? Then you're following the pointer. So this, this is called dereferencing. So then you don't do anything with the pointer. You're just seeing what the pointer is pointing at. So go to that location and then you have your variable. So this over here, you could also put uh, braces around it. So that is kind of nice one entity. This over here is an integer and it is over here. So this is these four bytes over here that you're then assigning the value 17. And you're not doing anything with your pointer over here that you had earlier. And, and the new int statement is not, a, not the integer, it's a... It is a pointer. Exactly. Yeah. But very good questions, because these are slight details, and it's really about knowing these three different types of things we're doing, or we did actually uh, at the past. So basically, a pointer is a new type, so you don't have an int and an int uh, or you have an int and an int pointer, those are completely different, right? Uh, the fact that you can assign it uh, the address of an existing variable is what we saw in the previous slides. In this slide, we will see that you can also create a new memory part or you can allocate a new memory part as what this pointer is pointing to with new and then afterwards you can <laughs> remove that again with uh, delete. Those are the three important points. Um, by you can reference or you can basically say I want the address of this existing variable with the ampersand and with the star in front of the pointer you can say I want to follow this pointer to get to the actual location it's pointing to. Those are the three major parts. I think you were first. Yes. Like, um, you said you can use the new int uh, at the beginning of the process of the Yes. Mm -hmm. well, Yeah. Well, that is the point. So basically think of this line over here as int star being one entity. That is the type of the thing that is called my int pointer. It's not an integer, it's a pointer to an integer or a pointer to an integer. Well, yeah, it's, it's basically its own type. That means whatever you have here is, you know, still preceded by this int star. That, that's the type of this thing that you have over here. Think of it as that. And you had a question? Yeah, after deleting the pointer, uh, do we still have 17 as a guarded value? Yeah, you might. So it depends on the, on the C++ compiler and the way it works, but you have no guarantee there. So typically what uh, all the textbooks say is the delete is actually doing something with the memory that, is, uh, that was allocated through the, through the pointer. 
the pointer still exists, right? Afterwards, I can um, create with my int pointer again a new uh, integer, or I can make it point to an existing integer that I had before. So all of that is possible. So I'm not deleting the pointer, I'm deleting the memory that, is the, that the pointer is pointing to. And the pointer itself just stays the way it is. It might. I mean, I think uh, a nice and safe way would be if this would immediately point to null. However, C++ is the language of control freaks or of embedded systems where every operation counts. That would be an operation that you sometimes don't want. If in the next statement I'm going to give it already a value that makes more sense than null, I don't need to do this, right? That's why some compilers don't do this and other compilers might. Yes. Um, in this case, the newly created integer does not have a name. Exactly. As opposed to the previous example. Exactly, yes. So the only way to um, address this integer is by dereferencing. Exactly. But can we do new int and then a name in the second statement? Over here, to give it a name, no, you basically allocate it and then you need to pass it to something that is already of exactly the same type. What this is, is a pointer to an integer. So you need to give it to a pointer of an integer. Yeah, so you need to handle this. Um, you could of course not handle this, then you allocated some memory, but you will never be able to address it, which would be a little bit silly, right? So that's, that's indeed very, very valid. Any other questions? Because this is important stuff. Going forward, this is I think the basis of what I'm going to see all next. Yes. Uh, sorry, say that again. It should be like initializing with null going to not null. Like keyword null. No, null is over here a pointer, is yeah, a specifically a keyword. Null can be considered like as an integer or zero. Um, exactly, yes, yes. So this, this, I mean, there are there are alternatives, we'll see that later. Exactly. And there are many alternatives there, too. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing in this chapter still quite a few um, C uh, parts that we then upgrade later, or even today already. Yeah. All right. Good. So let's continue. So basically, those are the essential bits. And this is basically saying whatever uh, what I said earlier, but now explicitly. So if we have a function after you uh, after that function ends, so in this case we have a function that doesn't return anything, so we don't need to return statements, but it will whoops, it will end right over here, right at the last line. So when this uh, when this function returns, this my int pointer is gone, and just as in the previous slide, this my int pointer is the only thing that allowed us to, to access that piece of memory that was allocated over here, right? And that is a problem. So basically, after uh, you launch the function, you don't have my int pointer anymore, but this memory is reserved and cannot be, uh, can it be reserved for other things anymore. So if you do this again and again and again and again, this is the typical thing you would have in a memory leak, right? So that, 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 that is basically what happened over here. So that, that is why I said, for every time you have a new statement, you also typically need to create a delete statement somewhere. Since we'll now already know about classes, typically you do this in a class at the constructor and the destructor, right? In a constructor, typically you already then create the things that the class holds that you can do by allocating it at runtime with new, and then when you destroy the class automatically, then you automatically then, when the object gets destroyed, you deallocate that piece of memory with delete. And that is um, how we from now on will typically do this. And since a constructor and a destructor is always called automatically, it's kind of guaranteed by the language that you automatically allocate memory that you can use, and you alloc uh, automatically deallocate this memory while, uh, when this object is removed, which is then the nicer way of dealing with new and delete, okay? Um, and then this is again to specify um, that things can go wrong if you don't assign this pointer to null after deletion. Um, in this case, it doesn't matter that much because nothing is happening anymore. Uh, but if we then delete it, then we typically also expect people to immediately assign null to it. Say another programmer comes and then starts after this line adding some more codes 
and then using, for instance, our my int pointer in the wrong way, then some behavior might start appearing there that is completely random, because there's a pointer that could be pointing anywhere in memory, which is typically quite bad. Right? And that is what people uh, think about as a dangling pointer. You didn't specifically allocate a memory, yet that pointer is pointing to a piece of that memory. Right? That's, that might be not the, the best way of doing things. Okay. Um, now to objects. So basically, as I said, from now on, we try to do things all the time as objects of a particular class. So when you have a particular object, so like our GPS coordinate that we already had from our previous chapter, um, we can just, like the integer earlier, create now an object of our type class, right? So we have a coordinate pointer, so it's a pointer to a GPS coordinate, and it's basically a pointer to an object of class GPS coordinates. And here I do this, as earlier said, in one line, in one go, that is the nicer way of doing things. So I uh, declare that I have this pointer of type GPS coordinate pointer, and I immediately assign it uh, the newly allocated memory um, that is immediately then shown by this particular type. And this type is basically then using our constructor. So in this case, the, the, the default constructor. I could have also left out the braces in this case, um, but this is from a, a, a d design point of view, I think not new because we know now already that objects are just like the default types that we've seen earlier, right? So that's exactly how you would do it. Instead of new int, you have a new GPS cord, but you have then your constructor notation as well. If you want to, for instance, already immediately initialize it with certain values. Now, the, the thing though, since now we have a pointer to an object of our type GPS coordinate, what is different is that we can't just use this dot to say we now are going to execute or call a method of this particular object, because it's not that object, it's a pointer to an object. And that's why C++ is using this particular notation that we already got last week, a little bit of a preview form with a this pointer, right? So this minus bigger than is like an arrow, something that points, right? And then um, you have what is on the left, your pointer to the object on the right, then the methods in this case. It could also be the attributes that is part of your class, right? So in this case, we call the method set with those two parameters of our object that is pointing to by the pointer court pointer. That's how you think about this line, right? And it's, in essence, nothing different than uh, creating an object here of GPS coordinate when you don't have this uh, star over here and you don't need this new statement over here and then having this dot set over here. So this is exactly the same, except that we don't create an object. We create a pointer to an object and immediately create that object. And also here we have only one variable that is uh, creating the access uh, to this object for us and is in this case not the object itself or its name, but it's actually the pointer that is pointing to this object. Why this could be interesting is something we'll see a little bit today, but uh, next week for sure when we talk about polymorphism. Um, and more interesting, or many interesting things you can do there. And also there, just as uh, we saw with the integer, we can also, of course, delete this, um, this uh, memory space that we allocated. So in this case, we can explicitly say um, we, oops, we delete, this is what I don't have highlighted over here, but we delete the memory location that this pointer is pointing to. So after this statement, we don't have our object anymore. It's destroyed. And what happens then, as soon as uh, this object is destroyed, is then automatically the destructor is being called. Uh, that's that's the, the important part. And then just as I said before, Typically, you then also assign null to it so that afterwards, if people are adding statements later, at least this pointer is assigned as something safe. It, it's kind of locked and, it's say, and, and the C++ compiler knows now from this uh, uh, statement onwards that uh, this pointer is not pointing to a valid memory location. So if people are dereferencing it and trying to go to that location, C++ will say stop, that is impossible. Okay? All right. And on the right, you see then that essentially not much changed, except that here you have a bigger memory footprint because instead of having an integer with four bytes being reserved, 
we have three doubles, I believe they were, plus uh, things that you know, point to all the methods of that class, for instance. And so we saw last time already that if you have an object of a class, basically this happens, so some of the memory is being reserved, and the attributes of that object are being part of this, uh, this reserved memory, but then the functions or the methods that belong to that class are all the same. They're also somewhere in memory, uh, and also that needs to be then uh, safeguarded by our C++ compiler. So that's what, what is happening uh, below the lines. And, and just like you have then the pointer to a, um, a integer, you could have a pointer to uh, an object of a certain class. So not much new happened here, except that we now use objects and classes rather than basic uh, variables like integers. All right. An array, um, we've seen already that an array is slightly different or uh, is, is, is uh, a little bit different in the way it uh, is being used or is being characterized. An array in C++ is an analogy to a pointer because the first element of the array is basically um, what, a, what the pointer is. So basically, if you have in this case an array of four characters, which we call my name, we initialize this as Tim, and I did, you don't need to explain or say C++ or tell C++ here that it's a four characters. It could do this without, uh, but we know that here this is a string, a C string, a, a typical C string, and it attaches the zero uh, character, not a character with, that looks like a zero, but actually that has the value zero behind it. So it's basically four characters, and those are being filled into the array my name. And that's something we already know from a few weeks back. What we can do now is we can say we have a pointer um, to a character and um, careful as we are, we immediately assign it to the null uh, um, uh, or, or assign it to null. So we tell C++ this is not um, a valid memory location. And then we assign it to my name. This is possible because my name over here is basically the location, the first location that is uh, occupied by our array, right? And, and this is something special. That's something that we didn't, we treated up until now arrays as a collection of, the, of a thing that has the same type. So in this case, four characters, for instance. Um, but the, the name itself is basically a pointer to the first element over here, as you can see over here. So as, as we uh, created our array over here, again, it has a memory location. It has some contents, every character is one byte, so it has four bytes over here, the last being the zero byte, as I said. Well, we now have um, this character pointer over here, which is pointing to this first memory location. The name, however, of this array is exactly the same. So, so that is something very similar to the pointer that is pointing to exactly the same location in memory. So that's how you should think about an array. And that will also explain why, uh, why and how uh, things happen when you pass arrays to a function, for instance, in a second. Right, and that way you can test over here that uh, indeed uh, the name Tim is being written out be um, because of uh, exactly what is being written here. So if you have the character pointer that we just created and assigned to uh, the pointer over here, that means the values that you have here in those two pointers are exactly the same, or both pointers point to exactly the same location in memory, then you can dereference it, and then you get immediate to the first character over here. Or if you just uh, get the first array character, or the second array character, so with the one with index one, uh, because we started zero, remember, then I get the second character of our, uh, of our array, or of our string, and I can of course also say, I dereference our pointer, or of course, actually this is the first time we see this, sorry. So we can do this as well. We can basically say we have our pointer to um, our allocated memory, and we can increase this by one or by two or by three in this case as well to get the access of this particular memory location. And then dereference that. This is, I mean, also done a lot in C, um, where you can, through pointers, then access uh, an array. And in essence, an array is nothing much different to what we just do uh, here with the pointers as well. So this notation is very similar to this notation over here. And that is what you should take from this. So if, if we 
plus integer is a byte shift. <laughs> exactly. Or it, not a byte shift, it's a memory shift. So it's basically shifting to the next address in the memory location. It, it depends on the byte of the space. Exactly. 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 Yeah, sorry, no, not, not, uh, not address, exactly, it's the type, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I think uh, you were at the back for first. A bit louder, I can't hear you. Am I referring to character? No, I'm, I have still my name as the array, right? That is this thing over here, which acts like a pointer, right? So this is, this, is, this is what happens in memory if you have this pointer declared and initialized over here, right? That means I have this over here and already have this over here automatically after the first line of this uh, program over here. And then I can do my name and I take the second element or the one with the iterator one, right? With the index one, sorry. Can I use the same style for the um, pointer? Yes. So we could also do character pointer plus one over here, just like we do over here, and it would also return i. Yeah. Can I No, uh, because it's not an array uh, or it's not initialized as an array over here. The other way you can actually, you can, uh, or, ooh, I'm not so sure. It, uh, yeah, it's, 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 yeah. So basically if you have an, an array initialized, you can actually use this notation to uh, address the elements of that array as well. <coughs> yeah. Sorry? I think not. Or it would not make that much sense because C++ in this case does not know that it's an array of multiple, well, not sure, but I think not. Treat it as homework. Try it out and you'll see. Uh, again, I need to. Yes. Um, a set of characters are more or less like pointers. No, I mean, basically, the name that uh, of our array is like the pointer. That you can say. But these individuals uh, over here, or these individual elements over here, are each characters that don't have a name. They're accessed through that pointer or through that array notation, but they're not pointers. A pointer are these two things over here, right? So that's the typical way you think about pointers. Uh, the, the name of the array is like pointer to the first element of the array. Exactly. Exactly, yes. So the, the, the name of the array is a pointer to the first element of the array. So the array with index zero, basically. So that is your pointer. And therefore, you can also increment it over here. Um, but the other elements are just characters, right? So you can access them by the pointer. But they are not pointers. All right? So I have a question. Oh, yes. Sorry. You, you um, also have one. I use the quotation marks. Yes, but inside of the square bracket you have four. Yes. Yeah, what happens if maybe you have three there? It will not consider zero and n or what? If I have three here, I will definitely get a problem because this over here is a constant C string. So it's an array of size four uh, that I'm trying to cramp into something that is less. So I'm pretty sure that C++ will complain. Yeah. What happens when you have the other side? I'm not entirely sure. So, yeah, that, so if you say here five, I think nothing is going to happen. You basically have your last element of your array not filled. It could have any size, but it basically is possible also to do this with a normal array, right? You can just reserve five characters, and you can fill some of those, but not the others. So I would say that's definitely a possibility. The nice thing, of course, would have been to leave the four out. As we know, basically C++ knows that this has a particular size and will adapt automatically our array size if we do this. Yeah. I just wanted to kind of hint you to the fact that this is not three <coughs> characters, this is really four characters. That's what I hope you uh, will get triggered when you read those slides again. All right?
Good. And that allows us to also then dynamically allocate arrays. Now, the dynamically allocating arrays was not a possibility up until now. So up until now, when we have had an array, we had to immediately, when you declare your array, say well, how big this array is going to be. Because as soon as C++ is looking at your program codes, it will need to know how much memory it's going to reserve into memory when you, when you have this, a particular array. It needs to be of a particular size. If, it's, if you don't mention this, like in the previous slide, if you don't mention this explicitly or implicitly by assigning it to something that has already a certain size, then C++ will definitely complain. So creating an array dynamically was up until now not possible, but through pointers you can. <clears throat> so that's what we're going to do here. So we can, for instance, get at a particular time in our program uh, uh, the size. So for instance, while the program is running, so uh, even as soon as it's compiled and uh, uh, an executable is created, we can run this executable. And at this time, you know, you can get from a file, for instance, a particular number. So you have, for instance, file data, and then you get its size. Only then you know how big your array is going to be, for instance. That's why I try to say with this uh, first line over here. In that case, through pointers, we can now allocate ourselves memory that is dynamically allocated, that has a particular size, that only at runtime now is really known. You know, when I compiled our program, this file might not even be there, right? But now when I'm running the program, the file suddenly is there, has a particular size, and this size is going to dictate the size of the array that I'm now going to create. And this will be an array of GPS coordinates, which has the name my root, right? So um, I have again what we had before, so a pointer to a GPS coordinate objects, which uh, is going to become an array or uh, something that is going to become very similar to an array. And I can assign it here to a new GPS coordinate. But this, this time I'm not saying I'm going to create one of those objects. I'm going to create size of those objects, with size, for instance, being 20. You know, in that case, I would create 20 objects of class GPS coordinates. And this is called dynamically allocating uh, an, an array of a variable size. So up until now, only now this size was, was known. And then now we've, uh, so if this file size uh, was 20, we now create 20 GPS coordinate objects. And if it was 200, we now create 200 objects. That's quite powerful because, first of all, we couldn't do this before with arrays, but also now we can reserve memory ourselves uh, um, in, our, in our system. And then we need to, of course, fill that with a particular thing. So we might have, for instance, these methods from, the, from our file data object, which could, for instance, supply us with new data um, and uh, which would put this in a particular uh, option. So apparently file data can also be uh, treated as an array over here. Um, and we can, for instance, uh, then using the set and set elevation methods, as we already knew from last week, um, to this particular object, to the height object, going from zero all the way to size minus one, as we would have uh, with an array, right? And afterwards, after you're doing something with that root, which is basically an array of objects of type GPS coordinate, you can also delete that. The new thing, however, is that since this is an array, you need to tell uh, C++ that it doesn't need to delete through the pointer, the object that it was pointing to, you need to tell actually it was pointing to multiple of those objects, which is an array. And therefore, we use this array notation. So this is nothing more than telling C++ when you delete the memory allocated through my root, then delete the whole array. Okay? And here you said it is an array that you create over here. So that is the new thing in this, in this slide. Yes? If you do here just a delete, good question. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, again, try it out at home. I would say yes, because it knows already that this is an array over here from this point on. So I would say yes. But again, I mean, also there it could be that a compiler is constructed in such a way that it doesn't mind. But in that case, it could be that you deallocate only the first object of that array. 
So I'm not sure what will happen. And it might also be completely different between C++ compilers. Maybe at least the new version of the compiler, they will see that maybe it's very useful. Exactly, yes. But I mean, if you go into embedded uh, systems, you know, sometimes you have very old compilers there anyway, right? So, and C++ is quite old already. Somebody else had a question? Yes. unspecified here. So in this case, no, it's definitely an object. You know that because you get here a method, right? That is being, uh, that is being called. Mm -hmm. So it is obviously an object, mm -hmm. but this is a particular notation that uh, leads to believe that we have certain ways to uh, access this object through other means. Yeah. It's an array of objects. It could be, but in that case, why would you do this? I'm not so sure, to be honest. Yeah, but it's a good question. I, I should check uh, if I have code behind this. Yeah. All right, any other questions? So to recap, the new thing is really here that we, uh, we can immediately allocate an entire array. We have to delete that array because for every new, you have to have a delete. Uh, but the, new, the nice thing is that from now on, we can actually allocate arrays of a dynamic size. That's a new thing. The only thing hindering us is in this case, or the only limits that we have here are our memory, right? And that, that is really the only thing. Okay, here's an example um, that uh, is fairly simple. That is something for you to do at home or uh, in, the, in the exercise uh, sessions. Um, the new thing that I just wanted to show here is that uh, if you have the main function, you can also uh, catch everything that is uh, typed behind or given as an argument to your executable. So as you saw all the time when I gave you an example, I did this via the comment line, and then when I launch the executable, typically you can with a space and add a couple of arguments, one or multiple arguments. And this can be gotten through these two particular parameters of our main function. So this over here is the number of arguments that you gave when you were executing this uh, executable, and these are the actual arguments, with the first one being the executable itself that you launched, and the second one would be then whatever you typed after, <laughs> and it's separated by spaces. So try this at home, and then you will see that this is a way that you can define an array at runtime, not at compile time. Okay. The next thing is references, which is very similar in concept to uh, pointers, except that a reference is nothing else but an alias or a second name for the same type uh, of, of uh, element that you have. Was there a question? No, oh, okay, sorry. I thought I, I heard some, oops. Uh, so again, here I have a number over here. This over here means that I'm going to declare a new thing that I call my phone, but this ampersand over here is nothing to do with the ampersand that we saw earlier, so I'm not looking at the address of something that is my phone because I'm now declaring it, so it would, make, would, would, not, uh, it would not make uh, sense at all to do this. This over here is saying this is a reference. So my phone over here is, uh, needs to be immediately assigned, so whenever you have int or some other type, and then the ampersand, you basically have a reference of this particular type. You give it a particular name, and then after the equal sign, what you initialize it as is that you give it uh, exact, or you have them basically something that is a reference to a, exactly the same contents as this uh, name over here. So this means that from now on, you don't have just my number as a name that, is, uh, that, is, that C++ knows is a memory location with particular contents and a particular number that has been filled here. But my phone is exactly the same. So it's not a pointer. You don't have a pointer that is pointed to this location. No, it's basically yet another name. It's an alias. It's a second name for exactly the same thing in memory which in a way a pointer does as well, right? A pointer is also a name for another thing in memory, but that is more under your control. This is something that C++ manages for you, and therefore it's called a reference. So inherently, it is similar to a pointer, but uh, think of it as a second name for a variable that you already have. If you have another number, then of course this is going to occupy a different memory space. 
What you uh, um, can do is in that case say, my phone is getting the value of my other number in this case. So these two numbers are completely different. So before over here, I would have exactly this situation. So my number and my phone would have the value 7 million and so on. My other number would have the, the value 2 million and so on. If I now say my phone should get a new value, namely that of my other number, then suddenly both my phone and my number have this number as well. That means the three variables that I can think about in this scope over here, which are my number, my phone, and my other number, all have exactly the same contents. But in memory, I have two variables that would have the same values. Those two would have the same value, and this one would have also that value. Okay? Yes? Uh, so the variables, my phone and my number, they will share the same address. Exactly. They share, this, they, share, sorry, they share the same address. Therefore, as soon as you gave my phone a particular value, my number would have been getting the same value again. Because those are exactly this piece of, of memory. Yeah. So the same address is a, a, the exact uh, correct formulation. Yes. Yes. Um, so if you do here the ampersand sign, no, no, if in, in the second line, second line here the ampersand. No, it from the, where the int is, then it put it into to the yeah somewhere there to the type because it, isn't it like the dereferencing case when you're allowed to make an int so somehow like this? No, I mean what, what would you want to do with it or how would you want to think of this? So basically the type over here is. Again, different. This is not an integer. This is not an integer pointer. This is an integer reference, right? Yeah, this is what I thought. And then, then you could also write like int and then the... Oh, right. You mean... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. No, exactly. You know, I, no, I get it. I was a bit slow. So, yes. So, you're basically moving this space over here, right? That's what you mean. Yes, of course. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So that is exactly how you can think about it as well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now, we already saw call by reference. Oh, no, we didn't say call by reference yet. We saw call by value. Um, did we see call by reference through the arrays already? Yes, right. So we knew already if we pass an array to a function, then you're, and you ch change that array in the function, the contents of that array, for instance, you swap two elements, then it will stay swapped as soon as you get out of that function. And now we'll see uh, why. So basically, we know already from our normal function, this is kind of a reminder that this will not work. In our traditional function, or also method calling, whatever you add here uh, in this particular, or what you have here in the signature, are two parameters that are standard variables. And if you have those standard variables, you can do, you have them over here, and they might have the same name as the variables elsewhere, but they're completely different. That means as soon as this function is then left again, this blue part over here is disappearing, and you might have swapped those two values between x and y, but it didn't do anything, right? So th this was not a way to swap two values. Um, we saw that for an array, you could do this. So if you would have, instead of two integers, you wouldn't have an, an array of two integers, for instance. And over here, you would add this array as the, as the one and only parameter, then you would get swapped. And the reason is because an array is basically, or the array name is a pointer that uh, points to the first element of that array. So what we were using while passing an array to a function was really we passed a pointer to that function as, an, as, a, as a parameter, just like here. And if you pass a pointer, as a parameter to that function, you're calling by reference. So in this case, whenever I pass the pointer, um, I'm, uh, I'm having kind of, uh, I'm not copying the value uh, that I'm passing over here. I'm actually dealing with that memory location that was uh, given to the function. And so the function has, in a way, a pointer that is pointed to a completely different part of the memory, which has still this particular value that I used as a parameter when calling my function, right? And that's why 
If I call here swap with A and B, and those are two parameters, but in this case, I, uh, ref I use their, um, with the ampersand, I use their memory locations, right? That's what I pass over here. When I swap the pointers that I'm getting here, I'm actually swapping the contents of those two allocated memory parts or locations. And that is why this is called call by reference. Right? So in this case, we do have the right um, uh, functionality that we wanted with our swap function. We have two parameters. And if we then give that, uh, uh, that whenever we call that swap function over here, the contents of A and B are indeed swapped. And the difference is that we did not provide the function with the copied values of A and B, as in the slide before, we gave it the addresses of A and B, so pointers, um, and those were then used as pointers in our function, and uh, which allowed us to then swap the values. This is not such a nice, or this works, but this is not such a nice location, uh, not notation. So typically what we do is exactly the same, but using references. And that is what, how typically people then use um, uh, or, or use call by reference with a reference. It's exactly the same, but as you can see, the notation is slightly nicer. So if you call the function over here, you basically call swap with the variable, variable A and variable B. But then from the signature of our function, you can only here see that those are not integers, but that those are references to integers both for x and y. So what you're doing is exactly the same as in the previous slides. It's just that here, with instead of a, no, a pointer notation, you have the reference notation. And the nice thing is that when you call the function, it looks like a normal function. You just have to know when you call that function that you have to look at the signature so you know that these are not integers, but um, um, uh, the addresses of those integers. And then in that function implementation yourself, so when you define the function, you can use x and y over here as normal integers as you would use them in two slides ago. So by just changing the signature of swap, we now call by reference instead of we call by, uh, uh, we call, call by value. So we do swap the two. The only thing that has changed are these two things over here because we're using references, which are very similar to what we did uh, in the slide before, two pointers, instead of uh, copying the values of uh, an integer into another integer that happened to be the other parameter of the function. Okay? And that allows us now to, whenever we uh, declare or start a function ourselves, we can choose by uh, defining the parameters this way or the other way whether people can actually change the values of those parameters after a function has ended. Right? If you need to change those values, then you call by reference. If you don't, then you call by value. Yes? Uh, but is it possible to uh, call by value if you declared it like uh, a call by reference? So we have like the yes. So well, it's not call by value because it's not copying the value, but you basically have exactly the same location, but if you're not, you don't have to change the, the variable. That's what you asked, right? Uh, yeah, but is it possible to assess like the int a is 5 or b is 10 in the swap function, so not the direction? So, uh, like the value uh, afterwards. So if if we didn't have a swap function, for example, mm -hmm. um, but something different, but um, we only had like the addresses, is it then also possible to assess the values of this through the address? Not to access the values. To access the values. Yeah. But that's exactly what we do here, right? So we get the value of x and assign it to temp. I mean, this is basically a statement. A statement always returns something. Think about it that way. So we do ask here the value of x. Um, and we use x as the notation of the variable that has exact, or that is basically pointing at exactly the, or is exactly the same location as a in this case. Right? It's, so this int uh, ampersand is what we have here of x. But if we then use x over here, we're talking about this particular location over here. Right? So that's... That is what, what, uh, what happened when we called this function with the parameters a and b. Yeah. Okay. Try it out at home. I mean, really try it. Just you can create some small programming and see what comes out of that. I mean, that is typically how you, 
uh, look at what can what can happen and what can not happen. And typically, the compiler is your uh, your safeguard that will complain when something is really out of order. Yes. Um, no, but this is cleaner. This is nicer to look at, I, I think, and it also is a little bit safer. So if you would do this with a pointer notation that we had in the, in the previous slides, then you could, through those pointers, do lots of other things that you can do this way. Again, references are these aliases, right? That means C++ is doing the pointer thing for us, and that has some safeguards in place as well. Yeah. So that's why we typically use uh, call by reference in min most of the cases. It would not make much sense to do it uh, to the point to notation, no. I think. Uh, what is the question? So call by value? Oh, right, yes. But in this, in this case, for instance, so call by value, uh, is that more efficient or less efficient than this? I would say it does not matter that much uh, because you basically reserve things in memory, as you can see right here, right? It, there might be a slight difference in what you reserve. So if you would have a uint8, for instance, uh, instead of int, you might see some bytes uh, or you might see some changes in the footprint, but I would say the differences are minimal. Yeah. Yeah, but good thinking. You know, that's, that's exactly what you should or how you should think about things. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, what you do typically is also when you have a variable that you, um, in, in a function where you uh, have as a parameter um, call by reference, <clears throat> and you don't change those variables, that is sometimes a possibility, then you can, can, you, you can add constant in front of it. So in that case, those are constant references, and that is typically... Uh, a nicer way of dealing with things. So sometimes you do want to call by reference in a function. In this case, you would not want to do this perhaps, but sometimes you might. Uh, but in this case, you can also by the signature signal to other developers, well, in this case, this is a call by reference, but this X is not going to be changed, right? So they don't have to look at your code that is following there in the definition of that function. By having cons in front of it, you already know that this will stay. So our x is not going to be changed. So that, was, that is kind of a, uh, something that people use. There's no discard we already know, right? So if in this case our sum returns an integer, in this case we have in this uh, context a function that is begging people to use what is, what is being returned. So you can actually use no discard, discard here. So if anyone after us would uh, use our function and would not use what is being returned. So if I would, for instance, uh, just say as a single statement, some 3abc over here, for instance, with a semicolon afterwards, then it, the, our whatever we produce is never being used. That is something we don't want. So this is yet another example of this no discards attribute, right? So this is not something that we want to do uh, for this particular function. And that's how you can set this in C++. Yes? Wouldn't it be uh, um, more inclusive to use just the integer values, uh, variables instead of using cons references? Yes. In this case, you could have done just that exactly. So there's, there's not really a, a, a reason pro or con, but if this developer really wants to use everything or call by, by reference for one particular reason, and sometimes there are reasons for particular objects to do this, so if you have an object of a class that is quite large and you want to copy that object, then you might always want to call by reference. Yeah. And if you're not changing that object, then that would be a reason to, in this case, call by reference. Right? For an integer or an unsigned 16-bit int, uh, integer, I see your point. You don't need to do this in this case. Yeah. All right, here's the next example uh, for doing things at home. A very simple one as well. I'm just going to go over this is just to make sure. I mean, if you can do this, then you have understood the reference points. Right? That is the only thing that I want to say about this one. 
um, and you can um, look at it at home or during the exercise classes. The next thing is copy constructors. So we're going back now completely to objects and classes. Um, and we go back to our example of GPS coordinate, which, remember, is a class that holds the latitude, longitude, and elevation. So therefore, it's kind of a collection of data and methods that you can use. And perhaps there is another type of class, UTM coordinate, which is not the same as a GPS coordinate, and you want to here provide um, uh, a, um, a method that where you can pass a coordinate, right? So we know that we can pass an object as a parameter to a function. Um, so when we pass an, uh, an object, we have exactly what I just said. So in that case, we have call by value. So what is happening if we now, for instance, uh, call this method over here, our from methods, and we pass place, which is an object of GPS coordinates, in that case, place is being copied, right? Just like an integer would be copied. So the contents of our place need to be copied, and that is then part of our function call. So then our function, whatever is, is over here as part of our methods uh, from, is then having the copied value of our place over here. And we have it as a name chord. So chord and place would have the same values and the same contents, but they would occupy two different parts in memory. Right? That is the problem with, or that is the property of um, um, call by value. So that is requiring us to somehow have this copy thing. Right? We want to have a way to say, when we do this, how can we then implement this? How can we then copy this uh, object of ours? Well, that is called a copy constructor. Um, and that is, uh, again, a new type of notation that, we, that actually makes sense. So it's exactly the same notation as a constructor that we saw before. So it is a method without returning anything with the same name as the class, but as its uh, parameter, has then uh, um, the, the thing that you're going to pass. So basically, the object that you're going to copy from, you can call that source, for instance, which is a constant um, uh, object of our class GPS coordinate itself, right? So we are in class GPS coordinates. We have a constructor, so same name. And as the parameter, the own parameter, we have this particular class as a constant reference, okay? And that means, or that is kind of the signature of a copy constructor. And in that copy constructor, we now can access everything source has in the same notation that we saw before. And uh, we can, for instance, then copy automatically the latitude to the latitude of our source, the longitude of our objects to, to, uh, that comes from the longitude of our source, and the elevation comes from the elevation of our source. And this is enough to kind of uh, define what a copy constructor would do if you would copy, if you would pass, for instance, uh, an object of uh, type GPS coordinates through a function, any function. It doesn't have to be a, a method of our own uh, class. It could be completely another class as well, like this UMTS um, uh, object uh, class that we saw earlier. So whenever then uh, we pass an object of this class, automatically this copy constructor is being called. We don't have to explicitly call it ourselves, just like constructors themselves, right? Okay? So our copy constructor copies our objects. Now, what I showed up until now is kind of a nice illustration of what happens automatically anyway. So if you don't define a copy constructor yourself, what is happening is that your, copy, your object is going to be constructed uh, or is being copied you know, by copying all the attributes that are in there. So you did not do, or did not have to do this particular implementation. If you would just leave out a copy constructor, you would already have that functionality automatically by C++. It would do this uh, for you automatically. So why am I saying this? You know, if C++ is creating those copy constructors for you automatically, or why would you have this functionality of doing anything yourself? That's because 
whenever you're doing this automatically or C++ is doing this for you automatically, it's doing this member wise. So for every member or every attribute especially, it's doing a, a, a direct copy. So latitude, longitude and elevation are three doubles. So in our copy, we will have exactly those same attributes and they just uh, are copied. So the values are copied from the three attributes of our source to the three attributes of our current objects. Right? That, is, that is automatically done, but it's a shallow copy. Now we know that if you have an object, then this object we could dynamically allocate memory. And if you do it this way by doing memberwise copying, and if you have a pointer, for instance, uh, or a dynamically allocated array, which is a pointer, now what you're going to copy is the pointer, but not the contents of, the, uh, uh, of which that pointer is pointing to. So here's an example of a deep versus shallow copy that I hope drives the, the, the message home. So when we have kind of a collection of GPS coordinates, which are now called GPS trace, right? We can create a, a constructor for that. We can create a destructor for that that we already have. We can pr uh, print them in a certain way and we can set uh, the contents of that, uh, uh, of, of uh, a particular point. So this is basically a very simple implementation of a dynamical array of GPS coordinates, right? And we call that GPS trace because it's a set of coordinates that has a certain sequence. So that is what is happening here. We have a pointer to a GPS coordinates, but this will be an array, right? That is going to be our, um, uh, our, our implementation. So this is how we, again, create this dynamical array. So as soon as we launch a constructor with a particular number of points, then we set a number of points to that number of points. Um, and we then create an array of that size of GPS coordinates. So as soon as we create this GPS trace objects, we immediately have a num points array of GPS coordinates. Okay, everyone can still follow. And that's what we allocated dynamically somewhere in memory. After you are done with this GPS trace, you can delete this, as we saw before. Uh, with, by deleting an array um, and uh, pointing to null and then setting num points to zero to be very clean about this. And the rest of the functionality should not come as a surprise. So whenever you print it, you basically deal with the points not as a pointer, but as an array. So you can say this is kind of the, the id value and you print the id value. And this print method is part of the method of uh, GPS coordinates, right? So that's, that's more or less what we have. Um, now the, the assignment is this one. So if we have now our main function and we want to uh, start a new trace over here and we set this to five. So in this case, we have five GPS coordinates uh, or a sequence of five GPS coordinates that we can fill in with certain function with a certain uh, uh, notation over here. That's what we do over here, and we do this in a way that also uses a copy constructor. So we create for each point in our trace a separate GPS coordinates. We give it a particular value. We give it a particular elevation, and then we pass this object to set points that we just saw in the previous slides. This is a little bit convoluted, but it works, and it's using our copy constructor. But this is using the, the typical copy constructor that we did not really have to implement ourselves. Right? It's the default the copy constructor that you could leave out, and it basically does a shallow copy. Now the question or the assignment is, do this in a deep copy for this T over here. So what if we want to copy T over here to another uh, GPS trace? That is your assignment. What will happen if you don't implement your copy constructor is, you know, looking at this in a sketch like this. So you would have your GPS trace P, that is the one you saw in the main function earlier. And if you then use the default copy constructor, what is going to happen is if you copy it, this is your copy, we call this P copy over here. Every element or every attribute is being copied. That means this value is being copied over here, and this value is being copied over here. But those two are different memory locations. Even though both are blue, you know, they are different parts of memory. But this one, this is pointing to this. This is pointing to exactly the same location, right? Because they were copied. 
Now the problem is that this GPS trace P and this GPS trace P copy have exactly the same values here as well, but there are loads of side effects that can now happen. Which ones, for instance? You can change the, like the values of the other ones. Exactly. So one can change the values of the other one. I think you were going to say probably exactly the same. So if we now, for instance, change um, the values of, the, of one of the points through P, so like, you know, we change this one to 5, for instance, then the thing that we copied is also changing, which is not something that you would associate with copying, right? So when you copy an object into another object, and you want to change this one over here, you assume that this one is not being changed, right? So this is something that is a side effect that you want to avoid. Um, and this is because you copied shallowly, you know? What you want to do is, of course, you want to instruct C++ to create a completely new um, array over here. And for that, you need to implement this as a copy constructor for P GPS trace. Right? GPS trace need to have in this case, an explicit copy constructor that tells C++ what to do if we're going to copy an object of GPS trace. Because by default, it would do this. And this is not all. You know, this is not nice. All right? So that is your third uh, assignment for next week. Second part, I need to go a little bit quicker because we only have a few minutes left. Um, this is just a side uh, uh, note. So basically, um, you can have cons. This is what we already have. You have constants. Um, and if you put this in front of your type, then you kind of declare or you, you tell C++ this value will never be changed. So if I have a, a trace length for a GPS trace, and in my program I set this to 150, I don't want anyone to ever change this again. So I say this is a constant integer. And if somebody afterwards tries to change this GPS trace length value, then they will get a complaint from C++ while it compiles this. Right? That is something to, ma to, to make your code safer and clearer to use for yourself and others afterwards. Right? So to declare something as a constant. Um, <clears throat> it also has an effect in memory, but that's something that I'll perhaps tell uh, about next week. Um, you can, however, also switch things and then say you have, a con you have a pointer of a particular type, which is constant. Then the pointer can be constant. It can be pointing to a constant uh, of that particular type, or both of them can be constant. Those are the, the, the different uh, options that you have. And then you can uh, put constant in front or all the way at the end. So those four over here are different notations, and they're all slightly different apart from the first and the fourth. The first and the fourth are exactly the same. They're a pointer to a constant integer. But then the second over here and the third are basically um, a, a pointer that is constant to an integer. And over here, you have a constant that is point that a, con a pointer that is constant that is pointing to an integer that is constant. Okay? And why would you do this? Well, there's certain options or the certain uh, circumstances why you might use this. The, the rule of thumb is, um, if the const is on the full left, then whatever is following is a constant. So in this case, for instance, or in this case that we already knew. And if it's somewhere in the middle, and everything that is on the left of the const keyword is the constant. So that is the, the other part. So if you follow that rule of thumb, even if you have then all these different possibilities, you'll be fine. If this ever comes uh, across, or if you have ever read code that does things like this. So that means that, um, and, and the, again, why would you do this? You know, just to give you a little bit of a pointer, so sometimes you don't want pointers to be changed, right? So if, the, if you make this a constant, that would be allowing others later on not to reassign this pointer to a different uh, uh, to a different address, right? So that's something that you might not want to, uh, or that you might want to enforce. Um, and then you can, for instance, prohibit this. And the same for pointing to something that is constant. So if you then dereference and then try to change this thing, then the compiler will first complain. And it's always better than having something um, that is uh, not entirely in, in, in your hands. So const in typically is a, a way for programmers to limit its, the use of a particular statement or a particular variable in this case. 
Okay. Now, if you have a method in a class, you can also, after that method, say const. Um, and this is only in when you declare the method. So if you're in your class, uh, the, in the header file, right? So you go to your header file of your class, then for, ev for some of the methods, you might see already const, or you might have seen that already, and or you might write const. This basically says that this entire method is not changing the attributes of your class. So, for instance, if this is a GPS trace, then the array of that GPS trace is not being changed if you call the print methods. And you can enforce this by saying const, that later if people want to, in the CPP file of our class, want to change the contents of our GPS trace, they say, for instance, that points 2 equals, and they're trying to give this a value, and C++ will complain about this. Because you said that you were not going to change the attributes of your class. And that's what, in this case, the const uh, means. And it's called const uh, method or const qualified method. Um, here is an example. Um, where oh, this is uh, another assignment, a very minimal tri uh, uh, an assignment that kind of uh, brings this uh, message home. Again, here I did the don't do disregard. What it um, or, or what I tries to get is I'm getting here a pointer to an address and I'm losing this address after a while, and then certain things can happen and other things can't happen, and then I'm also using this particular notation over here, which might also not be you know, uh, familiar up to this point. So this is why this is an assignment, I think, that um, would be a good, uh, a good exercise for kind of exercising multiple things that we've seen in this particular chapter, and it's using a const pointer. So that's why it's also an assignment that I only show now. So follow this, try this at home. I think it's not that hard. I mean, I would say even two peppers rather than three, but um, you probably would have to look, look certain things up in the slides that uh, came before. Right, almost done for today. The last thing is passing functions to functions. This is something that I, I think already discussed once when discussing functions. It sometimes makes sense, uh, especially if now uh, talk about objects and classes, to have a certain functionality where you have a particular uh, content or something that looks like uh, an array, like you have an object that contains certain things, and then you have as a method, uh, a method that could, for instance, take a function rather than doing something. That is nice because you can then afterwards, outside the class, create that function, and then that function is then given as a parameter to a method of that class. And that class could be, for instance, uh, say, um, do I have something of, uh, it's not a class in this case, it's a function, but anyway. Um, so for instance, in this case, you have something that is uh, it's called to call function um, on a particular uh, uh, thing that I have, like an integer in this case. And here, this notation is nothing more than using or passing a function. And it's basically passing a pointer to that function using the pointer notation. That's why I have explicitly those braces over here. If I wouldn't have those braces over here, then I would have a pointer to an integer, right? Or an integer pointer. That's not what I have here. By using those braces over here, I have a pointer to a function. Right? And that's, that's the, the difference. And I can use this notation or this notation, both will work, to then say, I want to apply this particular function to this particular integer over here. So this is a way to pass a function through as a parameter uh, uh, through um, our function. So inside our call function, we now have the functionality of that function, even though we did not define this function over here. We defined this function earlier or later even, so these functions are two uh, uh, examples of that, and then we can pass those functions as parameters to another function. Right? That is the, the, the new thing here. Uh, a question in the back, yes? What if we have multiple variables? This is not a, for a, multiple parameters over here. Um, then nothing special is happening. Because basically, I mean, this, in this case, you have just always two parameters anyway. The first one needs to be an integer. The second one needs to be a function. 
Thank you for that question because that is like what I forgot to say. It needs to be a function or a pointer to a function that takes one integer and returns one integer. That's important. You already get a signature by, um, uh, by, by this as well. But then your question is? Mm -hmm. Well, then I would have here two integers. So that would have int, comma, int. Yes, exactly. Sorry. That's, that's exactly correct. So, or if I have no parameters, I would just have braces here. Right? Um, if I would have a void, I would have a void here. Right? So that's, that's important. So these are the parameters over here. This is what the function returns. I try to go too fast, and that's what you get. I, try to, I, I miss things. But thank you. That's indeed what's the point. Um, this is the uh, function or the, no, uh, the, no, uh, the notation nowadays in C++ uh, from a while ago already, from uh, standards 11 onwards. People typically use uh, this notation that is a little bit different, but in a way exactly the same. So note that nothing changed apart from the fact on how you declare this. It uh, takes away this pointer notation. Um, and it basically uses this uh, standard function notation that you need to uh, include. That's the, the disadvantage, if you want that, but it is basically the way to do it nowadays, to say that you pass a function as a parameter to another function. Okay? And here is, um, again for home, uh, um, another or a last assignment. Um, this is probably the, the, the more difficult of all of them, or it will take perhaps a little bit longer. But here you would have, or you have already a class called number sequence, which is a sequence um, which you can see it here already is going to be dynamically allocated array of unsigned 16-bit integers. I already say here what type of methods I want to see here, and you need to implement those. So that in the end, in the main function, you can create an object of that number sequence, and then you can uh, in, invoke or you can uh, call a function that you afterwards outside that class create, for instance, times two. It takes uh, a parameter n and it returns two times that n. And I call this times two. And this function is being passed to the method of our class. So every element of our number sequence in that case is then um, replaced by its two folds is what is going to happen here in the main function. And then the assignment is, you know, create the implementation or implement those three methods that belong to that. It's not that much that you have to write. But that kind of um, is using multiple elements that we saw today already. All right? Mm -hmm. So those are the four assignments that we have for you for next week. Um, Last and uh, not least, I think, and that's what I now and then start, now and then perhaps referring to, we've never looked at this before, and I think it's not necessary. That's why I only see this at the, at the end as a footnote. But basically, when your program is compiled and you have certain variables, for instance, or constants, then you can put those, that those are put into memory over here on the left side, on the low addresses in your memory. And the, the sizes of this code and static data are already known as soon as you run your program. So memory is reserved for your program, and this is, for instance, 100 bytes, and this is 100 bytes. That is known. Nothing is going to change there anymore because those things are static or global variables or your program itself, right? That is what is happening. And then the, for the rest of the memory, it's basically two parts that is, that are, that is uh, residing in your memory for your executable. One that is of, the, uh, both of them are of dynamic size, that means they shrink and they grow, but one of them is the heap and one of them is the stack. And, I mean, if you're a computer scientist, you know what type of data structures I'm talking about. Even that is something you don't need to know, really. Whenever you do new and delete, then this is the memory that you are uh, operating on. Whenever you're calling a function and suddenly you have their new memory that you're dealing with, you're, this is the memory that you're dealing with, right? So, as we saw, uh, when we talked about recursion, and you have then uh, a recursive function that is called a no 100 times, for instance, then you reserve into memory 100 pieces of memory for that function call each time. Well, in that case, your stack is being stacked up onto, in this case, from the higher memory all the way to, you know, towards the lower memory addresses. 
And for a new, every time we allocate something with a new, um, then we start over here and we grow our memory over there. Right? That is more or less what is happening. Another side note is that the stack over here is managed by C++ inherently. This is managed by us more or less. Because we tell it whenever we, did new, we create new uh, memory and where we can also give free that new memory. And that's sometimes why this over here gets defragmented and why you would need, for instance, a garbage collector, collector which the new C++ standards have, by the way, and which you can also invoke by yourself if you want more control. But they are inherently different types of memory, the stack and the heap. Just as a side note from now on, I will now and then uh, drop the word heap and drop the word stack, perhaps. Okay. It also explains, and that's why I'm showing it here, static data. So in the previous uh, uh, example for the mouse, I have to go over here, this static word explains why I'm doing this over here. I hope some of you will get questions there and we'll ask them uh, next week. Just as a, a pointer, final pointer. All right, any, more, any questions to this? If not, thank you very much for your attention. We'll start now with the exercise session, but it will be kind of voluntary, so only for those with questions. Um, if you don't have those, you're free to go. Thank you for your attention, and we'll see each other next week.